thanks guys. Appreciate y'all coming out today to our 2015 online marketing strategy guide mm -hmm. session here. I'm uh, Brandon Sauls. I'm president and owner of Intercoastal Net Designs. Uh, we're located in Oceanal Beach, North Carolina. Everyone know where Oceanal, Oceanal is? It's 45 minutes back down in Maxwell Beach Town. So um, recently we um, we were here at the Chamber Expo. I did uh, speak with you earlier, but there was a couple of us I think may have known that was at the Chamber Expo there. there. I just put that picture up. Um, see if you can recognize it, put a name to a face. Um, <laughs> You know, for the past 15 years, we've been doing website development, internet marketing, and um, hosting. Um, we've grown our team to over 30 or so here. Um, I brought two of my guys here today I'll give an introduction to in just a minute. Um, but today we're going to talk about um, your online marketing strategy. So you all should have this uh, handout here in front of you. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover different um, components here. Everything from email marketing, to search and optimization, to social media, and so on. But it's going to kind of be the 30,000 foot view. Um, we actually present on each one of these little topics here um, up to an hour, and there's actually one of these bullet points that David has an hour-long uh, session on. So there's lots of information here, but I won't go to cover it you know, in detail all today, but at least it'll get you kind of your mind thinking about it, and maybe come at us with more questions that you may have afterwards. So, um, Well, I'd like to take just a moment here and introduce two of our guys. Um, David Hutnick, he's our social media director, and our director of search and marketing, which is Conrad O'Connell. Yep, and so social media, um, I do a little bit more than just playing on Facebook all day like some people think. <coughs> we do everything from Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, we manage that for clients, but we also manage the paid ad spend. So if you guys have any questions after the session, I'll be more than happy to help you out. Yeah, so David spends all his day playing on Facebook, or he jokes about it at least. I spend most of my day playing on Google, so spend about half my time working on paid advertising on Google. If you guys do a lot of searches, I'm sure you wear the box right at the top. And then spend about half my time focusing on organic SEO results as well. So first thing we're talking about though is email marketing. Not so great. Yep, so I'm going to dive into email marketing, but um, just remember all these pieces we're talking about here are very important. So you know, if, if you leave out one component of this, you're going to have a kind of a rugged running wheel. You want to make sure everything runs smoothly, so you need to make sure we address all these topics here. So the first thing I have up here is email marketing. So who currently participates in like a, a, a consistent email marketing uh, campaign monthly? Do you all do that now within your businesses or anything at all? Okay, one or two. All right, so that's good. So what I'm going to do is kind of dive in here. We're going to talk everything from you know, how, to, how to gather some email addresses, all the way to creating mobile-friendly emails to actually sending them out. And so uh, we'll dive into a couple steps here. Um, so you want to promote your email sign up to collect new emails. One of the easiest ways you can to do this. One of our sample clients here we have down in um, Myrtle Beach is after you're on the site for let's say 10 or 15 seconds, we hit you with a little email pop up there, and we want you to sign um, a little modal. We want you to sign up to get great new deals. So think of some way that you can promote something on your website and get folks to get you your email address. So we make it simple and easy, put the email address in, we click submit. And what we'll do later on is we want to send back a, um, maybe like a, a, some type of survey two to, three, two to three days later to that email address, <coughs> trying to get more information about that person, to learn more about the demographic, learn maybe when they're going to vacation in your area, if they're a vacationer, learn uh, are, they, are they a golfer, um, learn what types of products or categories they're in. Because we want to make sure we send out promos to um, or we don't want to send out promos to non moment members. We make sure we capitalize our spend on our marketing dollars. So here's like a post arrival survey survey we've done here. So when someone comes, um, this is a vacational um, customer of ours. Um, you've been there before, probably staying at a rental site or a hotel. And once you arrive, you then get hit up with a with a survey. And we want to learn more information about you. That way we can segment that list and get our whole targeted um, email campaign to you. One of the next most important things is to make all your emails mobile friendly. So how many folks in here check their um, smartphones or whatever for their emails? Just about everyone. <laughs> I mean, you know, we see in um, on some of our statistics, statistics that we look at, like a 50% um, or more is open on your mobile devices, which you see in here now, it's close to probably 90% if not more. So it's very important that your website or that your emails are mobile friendly. So I'll show you an example or two. Here's <coughs> one we've done, um, Seaside Vacations. And so this one we like to thank you is a mobile friendly um, email. Notice at the very top, this particular client has a mobile app, so we we'll promote that right off the very top of it there. And as we scroll down, notice our calls to action are inside those buttons. So like book today, it's kind of called a large button. So as I, oops, as I scroll down here, you'll see we have like a book now button. View specials, you know, book now. 
So really this, this website is, or this email is kind of a wide design, it's really just the background colors and then most of the content is found in a real tight call that's going to fit right on your iPhone, let's say. And so with the next example, I think you're really going to see, you know, full screen. So if you have that up on like Outlook or your Gmail, you're going to see those colors. So it kind of looks like it has a full screen display. We have all of our content is in that, that real tight column going down there. So it's important that you have an email like that, which you can easily get your thumb on and get on that, that person to that, um, that link. Uh, have an uh, email template designed to match your brand. So that's very important. If we go back to you just real quick, you'll see uh, this particular website is our uh, newsletter. It very much resembles our marketing material like you have out here, our website. So we want our brand to be very consistent. Also, um, this particular customer here, uh, Seaside Vacations, uh, their email looks very similar to the website. So everything from the social media profiles to the emails to the website, we want to have that consistent brand across. One other thing here is make sure you choose an uh, ESP that's reliable. So an ESP is an email service provider. And so once we put together this email, and you think about it so far, we'll talk about how to capture an email address by using the email mobile on the homepage of your website, um, you know, creating a mobile-friendly email. And now let's try to send this thing out. The last thing I want to do, and you've probably seen it before, people with BC, BCC or carbon copy on a list of 100 people in the outlook, <coughs> that's going to uh, have poor deliverability. You don't want to do that. You won't have any reporting or anything either. Programs like this here, uh, there's one called List Track, Constant Contact, or MailChimp. Have you guys heard any of those? Probably heard of Constant Contact, pretty popular one there, MailChimp. Well, they all three have different pricing models. Uh, list Track is like um, per email sent. So I can have a list of 100,000 sitting there on their servers, and they won't charge me anything except when I send an email. Constant Contact is a little different. They're going to charge you by the size of your email and not by the number of emails you send every month. And MailChimp, I'll put that up there because um, it's a pretty popular one, and the reason being is free. Uh, to four, I forgot the number here. You can send out to 12,000 emails up to 2,000 subscribers over the course of a month for free, forever. They don't charge you. So all I need for you to do is you know, take this information I provide you here, go to MailChimp, sign up for an account, and start utilizing this. You know, they have um, nice email templates. You can go in there. You don't have to have any HTML you know, geek skills or anything to get going. You can go right there and set that template up and get moving. So. Is there a big difference between MailChimp and Constant Contact other than the price? Um, not that I know of. Yeah, I know that MailChimp has that free offer. You know, Connor, do anything? Yeah, I mean, the templates in MailChimp are pretty good. That's kind of my default. If someone has a smaller business and they're wanting to send messages out, I don't have as much experience with constant contact. But typically, MailChimp is a great starting point. I've used them both, and personally, I prefer Mail MailChimp. Do you? Yeah. So. Yep, so give that a shot there. And uh, that's, something, that's something here today we're trying to you know, go over this with you guys and have to empower you. Give you stuff you can go back and do. So take some of these ideas and go back and put them to work for you. Um, you know, so with that said, you know, email marketing is very powerful. It's a great tool, but you also want to stay front and behind of these people. You want to be you know, front and center um, in their day-to-day -day life. And with that, a great opportunity is to use social media. So David Hutnick, our social media director, will give you some insight on that. Yep, and we do have this presentation available for download, so if you guys want to check it out later. And if you guys have questions or in a smaller group, just feel free to raise your hand. Take your questions we're going. So with social media, um, we, we split up into two groups. This first section is all about paid advertising on Facebook. The second section is all about managing your social media presence. And so when I talk about Facebook advertising, most of you guys think of like those right-hand side ads. Raise your hand if that's kind of what you think of in terms of Facebook advertising. What I primarily talk about is the news feed type of ads, where you can actually have, have ads come up on Facebook right in the middle of the news feed. So a lot of them look pretty organic. I'm just going to point out right here, you can always tell if it says sponsored right under the name. That's how you know it's, it's, a, it's actually an ad. Uh, so here's a few different types of ads. You can see they show up nice and large. It's right inside the news feed. So if you didn't see the little sponsored, it looked just like an organic post as if you had liked that brand or if it was by a person. You know, so sponsor those. A few different looks. So the first thing I want to cover is leveraging the $1 Facebook ad. This is one of those topics where I have a full hour presentation on just this one bullet point. So I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview. What this $1 ad trick is, is just trying to reach your fans, people who have said, hey, I like your brand, I like your page, I want to see your updates. But if you guys have had any experience working on Facebook, you know that most of your fans don't ever see your posts. It's very hard to reach them. In fact, uh, the average post by a business only reaches about 6% of your fans. Has anybody else experienced that at all on your Facebook pages? So why is that? Well, the average news feed on Facebook for a person has about 1,500 stories, potential stories, they could feed into it every single day. That's a lot. 
So Facebook uses their, you know, their algorithm to rank posts and say, okay, this post is going to come up first, this is going to be second, this is going to be third. And so when there's so much content, it's hard to reach your fans. You know, a lot of times your family or your friends or businesses that you interact with a lot are at the very top of that news feed. So this $1 ad trick helps you reach more of your fans. Now one of the best things with Facebook advertising is there are all these interest targeting. But with this one, we're just going to be targeting people who are already fans of your page. And these are just a couple screenshots I'm going to go through how you do it. Again, this is for, available for download. I'm just going to go through it quick. You create a page post engagement story, which basically takes your, your most recent post on your Facebook page and keeps this current in your ad. Uh, you're going to have it show up only in the news feed, not on the right-hand side ads. And then again, there's all these different targeting options, but you're just going to go down to the very bottom and select your page. So if you have a thousand fans in your Facebook page, you're only going to be reaching those people with this particular ad. And then the bidding on the last section, no matter what the suggested bid is, just put in a dollar. So throughout this whole process, what I'm doing is I'm saying, we're taking your most recent post on your Facebook page, we're showing it to just your fans, and we're bidding a thousand or one dollar to reach a thousand people. Okay, that takes a one-hour session into about thirty seconds there. <laughs> Um, the next point I want to talk about is never boosting a post. Always use the power editor. Have you guys seen that little boost post button at the bottom of your, of your post? Facebook tries to make it really easy for you to spend money, right? They, they want your money. So the problem with that is there's not a lot of targeting options when it's that easy. Just click boost post and you can target people based on country, you know, maybe age, gender, a few interests, but that's it. Inside the Power Editor, there's so many other options. You can target people down by zip code, 25 miles from this particular zip code. Or, hey, if they went to this college and they live in this zip code, I want to target them. So using the Power Editor, you can use all these targeting options rather than just a few. All right, I'm going to show you guys the Power Editor. Again, a whole other hour presentation just on this one. But I'll show you what it looks like. Um, if you go to facebook.com forward slash ads forward slash manage, that's where you get to your ad section. And you're going to see on the left hand side your account. And then down right below there you'll see a little button that says Power Editor. This is a tool that's built by Facebook and you have to use the Google Chrome browser. That's the only stipulation there. It's a plugin. And then once you're in the Power Editor, this is what it looks like. You've got the top section where you'll see your account. You'll download all of your ads into the Power Editor, so you're working on this computer. And then at the top, you'll also see Update. That's like your Save button. So after you've made changes, you'll click Update. That's going to upload it to Facebook uh, via the internet and keep all your changes online. Uh, you categorize your different ads by your campaigns, ad sets, and then individual ads. And then most importantly, make sure you up upload changes. That is your Save button. Uh, you'll see also a number of different um, Add objectives that you'll be able to select. Um, one of the most important things I always tell people when they're starting to work on ads is you'll see a lot of ads um, get denied. Do you have a question? Yes. Did you say on which that calls? The Power Editor is free. The Power Editor is yeah. free. Yep. You just go into um, your, your ads manager and there's going to be a little button that says Power Editor. Click it and it's free. You just have to be using Google Chrome and it's a plugin you'll download. It's 100% free. And it's, I mean, by far, I've used a lot of different things out there. It's a great system to use to make your ads. Um, but one of the most common questions I get is, you know, my ads keep getting, getting rejected. Why is that? And almost always it, it's, it seems to be because they don't obey the 20% rule. And so Facebook puts out this rule saying you're, you can't have too much text on your images. Well, before I found this, this tool, it's like, how do I know how much 20% of my photo is? Uh, and it, you know, it's, it can be kind of hard. So. If you go to that link right there at the top, forward slash ads, tools, text underscore overlay, you just upload your image, and then it'll tell you, you know, check mark the boxes that your text is appearing in. And if you check mark these, it'll say, okay, 20%. That's, it's a pretty neat tool. But that's going to be the number one reason any of your ads are going to get rejected. Uh, so try not to put too much text on your photos. Um, develop compelling headlines with exclusive promotions. And also create competing ads, test, analyze, and adjust. And I put these two kind of together. I'm going to show you some ads we ran. We were looking for a new cold fusion programmer not too far back when we found one. Did we get any off 
off of Facebook. I think we got we a few did. people. We did. So we created a few different ads to compete against each other. You can see they're all pretty similar. They used a similar headline. Uh, they went to the same place, but the, the ad, uh, the graphic looked a little bit different. One showed you know somebody on a hammock, a uh, guy working with his computer at the beach. You know, we were trying to attract people maybe from Greensboro, Charlotte, that were programmers to move to the beach and work for us. Um, anyone want to guess which ad here performed best? Female? Yeah, she <laughs> she got it. Uh, no, it was a female. Uh, definitely, I'll, I was trying to use borders with my photos, but a, a female face is almost always going to get better today. Alright, um, the next one is really big on this. Uh, it's retargeting website visitors and your email list. This is a newer feature that maybe uh, not many of you guys will know about. It's been out for a few months though. Um, Facebook allows you to create these custom audiences inside of Facebook. You can target people by your email list, website visitors. And so I threw a couple of different ideas up here on how you can really use this tool. If you have the email addresses and phone numbers of people who bought your product or service um, in this particular month, you can target them in that same month the next year. So you, if you can grab all the emails and phone numbers of customers in April, well, April next year, you know that they bought that same, same month the previous year, target them back on Facebook. And all you do is you take those emails and your phone numbers, you upload them into creating a custom audience in your Facebook ad manager, and it's going to match up those phone numbers and email addresses with Facebook users. Typically about 50% of those people will match up with profiles, but 50% is better than nothing. Um, website visitors, you can actually create a little um, thing that tracks people around the internet, and Conrad will talk about this on the PPC section, but you can, you can um, target people who are on your website, next time they go back to Facebook, you can target them with an ad that way as well, so that's a very targeted audience. And then the third thing here is what's called a look-alike audience. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Heard of look-alike audience? So what that does is you can create this very small targeted audience on your Facebook ads, and you, you know, whether it's by interest, demographic, geographic areas, maybe a custom audience like this, and then you can tell Facebook, hey, I've got this really great audience on here that I want to target with some of my ads. Create a lookalike audience. Well, these will be people that aren't in that small list, and it'll create a much larger list, people who have similar interests, similar ages, live in a similar location. I've used these and they've been very successful. And what this does is allows us to reach people who are very targeted, but have never heard of your brand. And the last thing is one of the things I really want you guys to take away from this section of the presentation today is hyper-targeting by interest. Facebook has all this information about people. There's over a billion people on Facebook. 93% of U.S. adult internet users are on Facebook. Uh, you know, there's all these stats. 25% of all time spent online is on Facebook. So Facebook has all this information about people. Use it. You can't get this information anywhere else, whether it's online or offline. So, you know, whether it's targeting people by geography, uh, where they live, what language they speak, how old they are, um, where they work or what their job title is, um, where they went to college, you know, use all those different types of information, all that information, and get a really small list of people who are very targeted. That's the number one thing I want you guys to take away from this uh, section. So, uh, kind of transferring from paying to reach people on Facebook, I'm going to pass it over to our SEO ninja here, Conrad, to talk about advertising on Google. Alright, so how many people here have used Google AdWords before or are familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah? Did you feel like all the money you spent in Google AdWords was spent efficiently? You didn't waste any? Good. Okay, because if that was the case, I was going to sit down. You were going to come up here and teach me. <laughs> because unfortunately, you're going to waste a little bit. So hopefully, I'm going to give you some really good tips here to hopefully avoid some of that. If you're currently running an AdWords campaign, Maybe snip some of that waste and spend out, be a little more efficient with it. If you've never run an AdWords campaign before, hopefully this gets you off on the right foot if you want to consider starting one. So the first thing, the most common mistake that I see with anyone who's doing an AdWords account is it's organized very poorly. So they may take their products or their services and they just kind of dump them all into one campaign or one ad group in AdWords and kind of lump it all together. That's not what you want to do. You want to make sure that the ad text that you're showing people is relevant based on what they search for. So for us, someone searching for SEO services where we are, is I want to show them a different ad than someone who's searching for a new website where we are. I'm not going to be able to write an ad that's going to encapsulate like both what people are looking for. So an um, easy way to do this is organize your AdWords account, typically like your website navigation. Your website navigation may have things broken down by products, by services, 
maybe different areas that you're working on, you probably want to create a different campaign and a different ad group for each one of those things. You don't want to loop, loop it all together, keep it all together. Um, the next most common thing that we see people kind of, it doesn't take very much time to set up, but a lot of people don't go through the effort of doing it, um, is add site links. So if you've done a Google search before, you've probably seen these. Um, this is an example one. people searching for Ray-Ban sunglasses. <coughs> the uh, Ray-Ban company here went and added these four little links in their case to look at different types of sunglasses. These are free to add these. They're going to charge you if people click on them, of course. But it makes your ad a little bit bigger. More people are going to click on it. And you can even send people to interior pages on your website, depending on what you think is most profitable. So if you're an event planner, maybe you could have people searching for event planning in Wilmington. You could put wedding planning there, or an engagement party, or maybe like a business or a corporate retreat. You could kind of put different options there for people to go in there and click. So it's really simple to add those. It doesn't take a lot of time. It can definitely increase the amount of people clicking on your ads and send you some more relevant traffic. Um, kind of the same line of what uh, David was talking about before, where we have different ads running in Facebook. You want to make sure you're testing different ads in AdWords as well. So maybe you thought you wrote a great text ad and people are going to engage with it and click on it. You're probably not right. It's, you're going to want to try three or four different options, um, especially if you may change up the text, the type of words you use to describe your products or services, use different headlines, um, just kind of have, always have a couple testing in there. Here are live AdWords accounts, or live ads, I'm sorry, in our AdWords account. We're running some for people looking for a new vacation rental website, and we're actually running some for a new conference that we're, or a conference that we're attending here in a couple months. So these are four different ads that are running to two different pages. We're kind of pitting them against each other, seeing which one performs a little better. Um, if one starts to perform really well and one's not doing well, we'll pause that, write a new one, and try to, try to kind of beat it. You know, always competing against each other. Um, another thing, and we were kind of talking about this before with remarketing or retargeting, kind of how you can follow people around the internet on Facebook, you can follow them around um, in other places too. So how many people have been on like an e-commerce website, maybe you're shopping for clothes or something, then you go on like USA Today and all of a sudden you saw the products you were looking at right on the mm -hmm. website. So it's pretty easy to set up, you know, it's a little trickier to set up that, that dynamic retargeting where the exact product someone's looking for shows up. But maybe you have a simpler website where you may have 10 or 15 pages. You can actually create segments depending on which pages people looked at and serve them an ad based on what they were looking at. So for us, maybe they were looking at a new website redesign with us. We're going to retarget them with an ad that offers them to come back, fill out a contact form, encourage, us, encourage them to contact us for a new website. Really simple to set up. You can typically bring back people for a lot less than it took you to acquire them in the first place. Let's say it took you a dollar or two dollars to get that visitor to your website. You can typically bring them back for half that cost or a little bit less. Most people aren't going to convert first time they go to your website. Uh, maybe a good conversion rate of three or four or five percent. You know, you can get that a little bit higher if you're reminding people to come back, fill out a contact form, complete their checkout, whatever your goal is. You can do that over um, We're kind of saying this before as well over here. About 50% of your effort or your results from AdWords or display retargeting advertising is going to be in the ad setup. So how you organize your campaigns, your ad groups, kind of all that work. The other half is really on your website or your landing page where you're sending people. Um, if you're sending people to a website that's not converting very well, you're probably not going to have great success. It doesn't matter how perfectly you set up your advertising. Same thing if you were advertising on TV for people to come into your retail store. If your checkout doesn't work, no one's going to bother to buy anything from you. So, Always keep that in mind. If your website isn't converting or you're not getting the leads you want from it, it may not be a good bet to do a lot of advertising. Yeah. For the remarketing, is there a way, so that's for people that visit your website to try to bring them back? Is yeah. there a way to do that if they visited a competitor's website? Um, not really. There's kind of some ways that you beautiful. can do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you could hack your website, put your code on it. <laughs> yes. um, there's actually a tool, there's a retargeting tool called Perfect Audience. So what they can do is you could have two websites that agree, you have to agree to share information, and then you can kind of retarget based on what people are looking at. But in general, no, not possible, unfortunately. That'd be great, though. We could like retarget people looking at our competitors' websites. So yeah, 50% is in the correct AdWords setup. 50% on the landing pages. So if the traffic you're sending to, you know, if the traffic you're sending to your website isn't converting very well right now, spending a lot more money on advertising probably isn't going to be your best bet. You may want to look at trying to figure out how to increase the conversion rate on the current website before spending a lot of money and kind of throwing it at a website that's not going to convert very well. And then kind of most of all, the last thing, it's the last thing here, but it's maybe the first thing you should do, um, have a clear business goal before you start doing, you know, AdWords. So we'd like to say a lead may be worth the next dollars to you, like $50, $100, $500. Figure that out before you start so that you can measure your success against something. 
Um, sometimes people just have ads in there, they're running, they're not sure how well they're performing because they don't have any kind of metric or bar to measure themselves against. So make sure you kind of have that set up front and your tracking is in place so that you know how many leads are coming in, how much you're paying for them. You're going to have a much better, get a much better feel for when you want to pause an ad, when you want to try a different ad or switch things up because you'll be kind of measuring yourself against something. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is organic social media reach. Back to David for now. Tag me in. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. I just want to hit on one thing. You mentioned uh, retargeting your competitors. If you do have a complimentary business that you want to, you know, you've got an alliance with, you can target their Facebook fans where they can set you up as an advertiser uh, admin on their page, and you can do the same for them, and then you can target each other's fans on Facebook. That'd be an option. Mm -hmm. bring that Before we switch gears to the organic here, so. So we talked about all the paid ways you can reach people. I'm going to talk about organic ways you can reach people virtually for free through social media. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is converting with strong landing pages and call to actions. So I'm just going to show you a few posts here. Um, and you know, we tweak posts all, all the time, just trying to find ways that we can organically reach more people without having to pay. And so you can see, you know, this was a contest. Sure, we reached more people with this, but specifically, we reached almost four million people on this post without a penny of advertising. And I, you know, part of it was the fact that it was a contest, but I'd like to think parts of it were just the style of the post. So I want to go over parts of that, like the, the call to action here on the photo, making sure people know and can see exactly what you're asking them to do, but also in the text, like, share, and tag your friends. Um, the fact that this was a vacation rental, I mean, lots of people went to win a free place to stay at the beach. Um, but telling them exactly what they're winning, and then another key element is having a link that's trackable in your post. Um, this is a, a tool called bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y. Um, you can put any link in there, whether it's a big long link, and it'll shorten it and also track things for you. So I just want to go over a few elements there of, of a, a perfect post on Facebook, but uh, most importantly hit on the call to action there in the post, both, both the text and the image. Um, utilizing engaging photography, this is always you know, a good idea, and putting text on the photo. I'm just going to show a few different, a few different posts. And it depends on you know, what your industry, what your business is. Um, any business can always use a meme. And some businesses say, you know, I, I don't want to use memes, that's not really my brand. Well, they reach a lot of people. They get a lot of shares, a lot of likes, and a lot of comments. And uh, as long as it's relevant to your business or your brand, uh, I'd use them. What do you call those memes? Memes, yeah. You can find them or create your own online. Yeah. Uh, another thing is short videos. You know, not not two or three minutes. I'm talking 10, 15 seconds. Very short videos where they, they might autoplay in the news feed, depending on the settings of someone. Or if it's 11 seconds, you know, I'll click on that so I can I can see what it is. If it's three or four minutes, I'm probably not. Gonna click. Um, social media contests that reach the right people. And so, uh, who's ran some type of contest on Facebook before in here? So, there's all kinds of rules that you have to follow. But how do you know that you're reaching the right people on Facebook? And I'm going to show a few different ways that we do a contest, and we know we're reaching the right people here. Um, well, first of all, with the contest, we make it easy to enter and mobile friendly. As Brandon mentioned earlier, emails are uh, more than half the time open on a mobile device. More than half of the contest entries we get are on mobile. We can track that. Um, make it easy to enter, make it mobile friendly, and make it very simple for someone to know what they're winning. How are you reaching the right people? Well, first of all, you're reaching your fans. If you do any paid advertising on your page to reach just your fans or friends of your fans, it's very relevant to people. So you can see a few different examples of posts that we've made for contests. Uh, we always put some type of button or call to action on the website. So if somebody's on your website, you want that person to be entered in your contest. It's just another easy way to get their email address or get a Facebook like out of that, that person that's on your website already. So we'll put a little button like that no matter what page or area of the website are. That's a little sticky button. Um, if they're on your email list, we always start contests off with a, with a bang, you know, a big key blast to your entire list. Telling people this is what you're winning, this is how you're entering, and a big button says enter here. Just make it very simple and easy. Um, if you have a, a place where people are walking up daily, you can have some type of sign. You know, I remember one of the first contests we ran for someone, we were running this contest, and they get all this foot traffic, and then 
you know, we realized they didn't have anything there for people that were coming in the front door. So, you know, you got to make sure that you've got something there when people are coming in the front door that they know enter this contest. These are all just ways that you know that you're reaching the right people through social media, through your email list, on your website, through advertising uh, in the front door. Develop a strong content strategy and optimize hashtags, timing, post types, call to actions. Uh, I'm going to go over what a content strategy is because this is important when you're talking between SEO and social media and your email marketing, but um, you know, obviously very important just through social media. So this is talking about what you're posting, when you're posting it, where you're posting it to, all, the, all, those, all that information. Um, the average post only lasts in a news feed for about three hours. So from the time you post it to the time it's not going to show up in barely anyone's news feed, it's about three hours. So the timing of your post is extremely important, whether you're posting at 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. There's actually a way in your Facebook insights that you can see exactly what time people are on your page, on your Facebook page. And consider theme today's, you know, throwback Thursday, thank God it's Friday, Tuesday tips, feature Friday, all kinds of things like that. Use a hashtag um, so people can find them. Create, uh, this is pretty simple, create content that people will like, comment, and share, and talk about. You know, don't just post everything and every, anything and everything to post four times a day. Post the content that people are actually going to engage with. Um, use social media to listen, not just broadcast what you've got, got to tell other people. Um, find out what a good frequency is that you can handle. Don't post like three or four times on one day and then nothing the rest of the week. Try to schedule those posts out or find a good frequency that you and, and your fans can handle. Um, timing, and I mentioned this early, use analytics and insights. Um, your Google Analytics to find out what time people are on your website, or your insights on Facebook to see what time your fans are on Facebook. And then, um, where do your customers spend their time online? Search that and find maybe relevant groups or other pages and, and reach them that way too. That's all part of your your integrated content strategy, and that goes between blogging and SEO to social to email marketing. The last thing I want to hit on here is a big one. There are so many different social networks out there between, even it, just the big ones, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, Instagram, YouTube. If, if you look at how much time it can take to really post on all those or keep a, keep a good presence, you're spreading yourself really thin. So my, my best recommendation for you is to choose one platform and master it. Then choose another one and master it and find out what you can handle. Rather than just saying, oh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, I'm on it. Well, how well are you doing each one of those? So try to focus on one at a time. I'm going to hand it back to Comrade here. You might chill. Mm -hmm. Hell, OK. And last time we froze people out, so I'm going to show up with this stuff. Cool. I'm trying to make sure we don't put all the sleep. Yeah. Ask some coaches to say, we we'll freeze you out, you stay awake. <laughs> so, kind of on the same thread that David was talking about, but more on your website rather than on Facebook, I want to talk a little about a little bit about some content strategy tips and ideas that you guys can, can bring home and use. Um, so, the first thing, this kind of came up when, when we were talking right when we were starting, is you didn't know like what to blog about. Um, in my mind, any company can find something to blog about as long as your customers ask questions. So if you guys don't have a business where your customers don't ask any questions, I don't think there's anyone like that. You know, people have questions about your business, certainly they're going to ask you things. That's always a great topic for a blog. So how you can do that pretty easily is with um, surveys. You can put these on your website. You can ask people coming in your store, ask your best clients or colleagues, you know, what kind of questions are people asking you? That'll probably be a great topic for a blog. So. Kind of start there. Um, there's even tools that you can use. Uh, one that we've used before is um, it's called Kiss Insights. It's basically like a little survey. I don't know if you've ever seen these before where you're on a website and kind of a little subtle survey pops up on the bottom right asking you a question. You can go in there and get feedback. People would typically use those to come up with new ideas, how they may want to change their website, and it's kind of a way for you to get actual feedback from people on the website. Um, industry partners can be a great, a great opportunity for guest blogging. So, for example, something we've done before is you may use a third-party payment processing system or reservation system if you're in the hospitality industry or any kind of business that you rely on to, to use your business, you can probably find a great opportunity there to do a guest blog. Maybe give a testimonial about how you use a product and you've enjoyed it. Um, and that's always a great way to get some links pointing back to your site, kind of making your vendor happy. That's always a good thing. You want your vendors happy. 
Um, and you're going to put your your business in front of the right people in your in your in your uh, industry. Um, kind of on the same thread as the social media side, but it relates to your blog content or your website content as well. You know, set up a content calendar so you're not struggling where you may post three or four at the beginning of the month, and then you're struggling to get more out at the end of the month. Maybe you want to say we'll post one blog a week or one every other month. You don't have to post as frequently as you know a bigger business may, but you want to have a content calendar so that you know you know, the rough schedule of when you are posting things. So just because you wrote something doesn't mean you have to post it right away. You can wait a couple weeks, kind of find a good time to post that. You could write stuff ahead of time and kind of get it ready. Always good to have some more people give feedback on it. Um, this is a little more technical. Or I'm sorry, share what we think. So um, David was saying before how it's great to share memes on your Facebook page and they get a lot of engagement. I think it's great that if you could get that quote to be from you or from your business, you know, it's fun to kind of pull an image meme offline and share it and get some people to engage with it. But it would be really helpful if you were having people share images that you had written, that you had created, and then your business is in front of people. Um, the next thing is a little technical, but it can definitely help you out. There's a free program you can download to your computer called Screaming Frog. Um, and basically what you can do is put your website into this program, and it will go crawl your entire website looking for any technical errors that you may have. So how many people have been browsing the website before? clicks on a link and then they come up with like an error page, a 404 page. Pretty frustrating. So this tool will go through and find all those kind of broken links. You can go in and fix them. It may only take you a few minutes. It may have been befuddling your customers for months and you just weren't aware of it because you didn't go on that page. So this is a great tool that will go and crawl your website kind of from a, a search engine perspective. It'll give you all kinds of statistics on, you know, the markup of your pages, how they look. And then it'll help you find things like broken links that kind of lead to a bad user experience. And this kind of has a full list of everything it looks at. I would say if you're just going to look at a few things, kind of look for some broken links first, because that's typically going to be an easy thing that you can log into your website and change. It only takes a few minutes. You don't need any kind of technical skills to fix it. I'm going to kind of be the person that would look at uh, Something that can work very well is if there's content in your industry that succeeded, you can most likely update it. So for example, for us, we may have a content idea for a, for a client, we may find an example of someone who already did that idea two or three years ago. Well, your industry has probably changed a lot in the past two or three years. So you could take that asset or resource that someone's already made, go and update it, and then reach out to people who have already linked to that asset and ask them to link to your piece instead. So if you know, you're in the legal industry and laws changed in the past two or three years, you could update it, bring it to the current you know, 2014 or 2015 standards, rewrite it, and then reach out to the people who have already linked to it and ask them to link to your piece as well because it's more relevant. You kind of already you know the idea is going to succeed before you even start it. So and then if you're totally stuck on ideas, you can't think of anything at all. Um, you can use a tool like BuzzSumo. So this is a pretty cool tool. You can go and put a keyword in there, maybe something related to your business, and it will tell you which content gets linked to and shared the most. So you may find that something in Myrtle Beach got shared four or five, six thousand times. Something in Wilmington got shared four or five, six thousand times. You can probably duplicate that, put a similar resource on your website, and see the same. Okay, next thing is going to kick it back to Brandon, all about converting the traffic that's already on your site. Buzz Sumo Screaming Frog, if it's out there, Conrad will find it here. He's got a wealth of knowledge on some really cool sites that do a lot of shortcuts in there. So. <laughs> the next one we're going to cover here is about Pro and UX testing. So, what is that? Pro, it's conversion rate optimization and user experience, essentially. So, this is really where it all happens at. Everything we've talked about, we, you know, we're working on getting folks back to your website through emails, through retargeting, SEOs, paperclip. But now we get folks to your website, and what are we going to do here? We're going to get, make sure we give them the absolute best experience we can. You know, we've been to websites before where you start the checkout process, and you get in there, and it's slow, there's too many form fields, you just log down, break down, you get out of it, and you go to another website. That's what we're trying to avoid here. So we want it to fall to simpler layouts and, um, you know, and not more complex. A great example we have here is a vacation home company down in um, Holden Beach. So think about it, if you're Googling Holden Beach you know, vacation homes and you land on this website, that's great because it says right here, begin your vacation search. That's probably why you made that Google search, because you want to start doing your search for a vacation home. So in our eyes, you know, this is giving that user a great user experience to come right there in the beginning of search. And what we say is, you know, you can spend thousands more dollars in marketing to get people to your website, but what if you just increased your conversion rate on that site by 2 to 5%? You know, these homes rent for anywhere from five to $10,000 a week. That could easily be you know, tens of thousands of dollars of revenue over the course of a year. So let's really focus on the traffic that's, that's on your website and give them the best experience possible. Uh, one thing we do here, um, this is just a screenshot. As we go down through the checkout process, 
when we get down towards um, like that, that sales funnel, the checkout process, we want to start eliminating some of the clutter that's there. One thing we do do is we remove the navigation and we'll give them a link back to the home page on the final, the final checkout page. We kind of want to lock them down in there. I think one of ours actually says that they you know, have, have trouble booking, call us at 1-800 you know, or, or, uh, number or you know, click to go back to the home page and get out. So it's just important that we work to get them down where they need to be. You know, sometimes you have blinders on your own website and think it's the best thing ever, works the greatest ever because you programmed it, it was your vision, you put it together. But what you need to do is use an outside review website like called usertesting.com. So um, this is a paid for service, about $25. You'd go there and put your website in, specify the kind of industry that you're in there at all. And what usertesting.com has done is they actually have just the average Dobo users out there that offer their time up to come through and perform a test through your website or just kind of make a dry run through it. And what happened is um, they'll record the video of them going through there. You can kind of see their mouse as it, as it goes through the process. And you can see where they um, may have slowed down, um, you know, hit a log jam or whatnot. And they will also provide you with um, real feedback that you can then have Q&A with them all. Say, you know, where did you break down at? You know, how can we make some improvements on our website? So a um, pretty cool tool, uh, usertesting.com. Other things you may want to do is actually do some A-B testing. Um, use tools, uh, there's one they called Visual Website Optimizer. Um, another one is called Optimizely.com. So basically these are like on-demand usability testing tools. So you can go in and have no um, HTML programming skills whatsoever and you can perform some A-B testing to your site. When I say A-B testing, you can change the color of a checkout button. Maybe increase the size of it and make it green. Um, there's different things you can do there. And so um, for this particular service we use, uh, Optimizely.com, basically says, hey, you can, you know, no technical bottlenecks, meaning you can do it yourself. And if you go to sign up for this service, I think there's a one month free trial they give you, is that right? Yeah, so you can, actually, one. You, you can actually go try this out yourself. But the one thing you do have to do is they require you to install a little piece of JavaScript on your website. Basically just one line of code, like this, this long. And so you, you have to do it or find your web uh, master or whatnot to install that on there for you, and then you can start doing these A-B testings uh, that we're talking about here. And basically they say you can bring thousands of, uh, of, of ideas to life in just a minute. So whatever you think of you want to test, you can try it out. Uh, other things to do is you know, start by uh, testing the end of your, your funnel or your website objective. And so let's think about it. If you get this, you know, this traffic to your website, what is your ultimate goal? Is it to, to capture an email address? Um, is it to get them through the checkout process on a product? Is it to get them to book that vacation loan unit? Whatever it may be, you need to go in and actually um, perform some analysis on there and see what the breakdown is. So this is a shopping cart for um, a client of ours here. And if you notice on the left it says, it's just kind of be there, but it says like 85,000 people actually got in the cart section, 45,000 started the checkout process, and 20,000 completed. So look at that drop off right there. So that's that conversion funnel we're talking about. We want this number to be higher. We want it to be just as high as this back over there. We want every person to start that, that shopping experience to, to, to go through and to check out. So what I want to do is just show you real quick, like a real world example. All of you like to drink wine, right? I imagine. <laughs> Here's one of my clients, it's called uh, Deliver My Wine. It's a wine delivery service. But what I'd like to show you here is, you know, we come in, you've all kind of been through this before, just like the product detail page. I can add that item to my cart. And then I can go along to the next page. <coughs> so, you know, here's the actual cart here. I'm, I'm, you know, my items I have lined out here, I can go to my next step. And then you're going to gather the shipping information, the billing information. And then here's the actual checkout page. And that's why I kind of want to zoom in at. I'm going to talk about testing different buttons here. Look at that big green submit order button. Mm -hmm. Those other buttons are a little grayer, a little harder to see, the apply a discount. You kind of see we were using a button like that that you see right over here. But so, yeah, let's, let's play around and change this to a nice green button and see what happens. And all of a sudden we see a conversion increase of just a few percent. And what does that mean over the course of a year? You know, hundreds, if not thousands more dollars at the end of the day in that person's pocket. So. Um, it's very important that, that you give that some thought. You, know, you spend all this money to get the folks to your website. So you need to make sure that, um, that you, you then do a test and get that conversion funnel really working for you. Um, one of the next most important things is just making sure that you're getting your return on investment and you need to do that through some like, analytics and analysis. And Conrad, you're going to give them more insight on that. Here you go. So how many people here have or are familiar with Google Analytics, have installed on their website, have logged in? It's kind of overwhelming. It can definitely be overwhelming because I think when all the menus are expanded on the left side there, if you've logged in recently, 
it's like 85, 100 options. I mean, you can look at so many different things. Um, but I just want to maybe cover a few things that you could look at that will probably help you understand what's going on in your site a little bit better. Um, so something that we, that we do when we're testing a website, whether it's e-commerce or people filling out contact forms, is we look at the conversion rates of different web browsers to find issues. So your web development team may have gone through and tested your website on 6 or 7 or 10 or 15 different browsers. That's good. Uh, and I hope they did do that. But what your analytics are just going to do is it's really going to tell the story of how many people are filling out your contact forms or checking out or whatever the business hole is on your website in different browsers. So real world example here, you may find that people using Chrome convert 3% of the time. People using Internet Explorer are only converting at 0.05% of the time. Your website probably has some usability issues that you may not have been able to uncover in Internet Explorer. You can go and test that and figure it out and help your conversion rate that way. Um, so many people here, we kind of said before, but are sending emails but aren't sure how well they convert on their website. It's kind of a really common thing where people are sending promotional messages to come back to their site and they just don't track them properly. So it's actually pretty easy to track emails. Um, you can use these fancy things called UTM parameters. But basically all you're doing is when you send a link back to your website, you can put certain elements on it that tell um, Google Analytics where that where those traffic is coming from. So it could be coming from a third party website you're purchasing advertising on, it could be an email, it could be you know, paid advertising in other channels, Facebook posts, I mean there's a lot of different places it can come from. Really easy to track with these UTM parameters. Um, so definitely encourage you to use those if you're posting links elsewhere on the internet and you want to find out how well those people are coming back to your site and converting. So this is actually a tool, um, gaconfig.com, where if you're posting a link and you want to be able to track it, you can just put in you know, your website domain there, fill out the source, where it's coming from, kind of if it's a paid or maybe it's an email, you can kind of fill out the channel where it's coming from, and in your reports you'll be able to tell how well that, that link performed, how well that traffic converted. Um, something we've seen before, something if we're not careful, we got to make sure we double check before we launch a site. Make sure that analytics is on every single page of your website. Sometimes people may have like subdomains or different areas of their site where they didn't install analytics. People go on those pages and then come back to other areas of your site. Kind of just messes everything up. Your numbers aren't going to be accurate at all. So, again, another tool there, GA Checker. You can put your website in there, and it'll tell you right. You know, in a few minutes, it'll tell you if you have any missing pages. And um, then, really recommend if you have a bigger site or you know more than a hundred thousand or ten thousand pages on your website, we recommend that maybe you have a professional go through, and make sure everything's installed properly. You're tracking everything you can, like contact form submissions, email signups, kind of track all the business goals that matter to you, so that you can measure how well everything's working. So that's it. We're definitely open for questions. Let me bring the other guys up here. Feel free to chat about Yeah. It, um, a lot of times when I uh, go online to explore these things, and, and even with some of the samples you all use, naturally things tend to skew more towards companies that sell products, you know. And um, I'm in a service business, and so how does a professional <coughs> service business, how does the strategy for that differ? You know, when y'all are talking to somebody like that, how, you know, how do you approach that? In other words, lead generation is incredibly important for you. Yes. <coughs> and so we're a service business too. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we definitely had some good examples of like people checking out physical products, right? But you're asking more about people selling services. So for you, I mean, instead of people filling out, going through a checkout process, they're trying to fill out a contact form. So for me, that would be the main thing I would look at. How easy is it to find your contact form? Is it simple for you to fill out? Are there too many form fields that just aren't necessary or you don't need? Are you encouraging people to get on your email list? Are people who are on your email list not really engaging, helping with your emails? So you can definitely focus on different things. I think the goal is the same. In your case, it's to get a lead instead of to get you know, someone to check out or buy a physical thing. But it may come down to, instead of checkout, it may come down to contact forms and people engaging with your email list. Are you using Facebook and so forth and those tools the same way for service as you are for product? Uh, depending on, are you talking like from an advertising or just trying to organically on your page for Facebook? Either, you know. Maybe. So with, I mean, what's your business? Public relations. Public relations. So if you're trying to reach people based on like job title, maybe, you could, you could try to reach people that way through ads. But I mean, your content strategy is going to be based on you know, the interests and you know, of your right. target market. So it, it's a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, what what I do is you know, with all the content we do and things we put out, it's educational. Like we want to form out, we want to empower you guys, and that's like today. I mean, that's, that's why we're here with this. With it being a service, you got to get out there and show them that, you know, the type of service you do, the quality of work you do, and the time you put into it. So we don't have a product. 
and so on. We, these guys have a content strategy. I mean, I think every week or so, they're one of the three, four, five of you guys are producing good educational information that we get out on our blog. And then we hope we get people back to continue to follow us, like us on Facebook, and on other blogs. see our interactions, and hopefully then put a you know, uh, email in and help us out. So, uh, any service. Um, you just want to say here, I appreciate you guys coming. Um, Nicole Michaels in the back over here, and April Burns. Um, Nicole is actually a rep here for Wilmington uh, area. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, I've been in business, uh, I see it's been around for 15 years. I grew up down in the Charleston, South Carolina area, so most of my clientele is like from Ocean Beach in general, that, that direction, that's where I know. We're just trying to make a little bit of a move back into the Wilmington area. We do have a national clientele with our, um, because we do a lot of the vacation rental industry, you'll probably notice there. <laughs> so we have clients around the U.S., men along the coastline, that type of thing. Um, but, you know, we do everything from doctors, lawyers, and the chief websites, you know. It's, you know, so um, if there's anything that, that you guys uh, have more questions about, come see us, drop an email into Nicole. She's up here quite often, we have to come schedule time to go over the stuff with you. Um, and there's a lot we covered in here today, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. it would be cool if we could get together with you and help put together a marketing challenge for you. Downloads page. Yep. yep, and so you go icmd.net slash downloads. So icmd.net slash downloads. And there's tons of downloads, not just mm -hmm. this here. Yeah. So we do about six or eight different presentations. And um, you can go there and grab any of them. Both this and the presentation is available for download. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've got about 15 different things on that. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is enter our email address. That's exactly right. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we have. <laughs> so, we're lucky. Uh, uh, we recently got a uh, partner with uh, Fly LM. Uh, Caitlin is here. She, and so, uh, we're excited to actually have that account. It's a good one for the women's area. And then there's one other, Nicole. What's, um, the, uh, Lewis Farms. Is it Lewis Farms? We have a few. We um, work with McKinley Builders. We work with Lewis Farms. We work with um, Love and a Rug. Yeah. Um, so those are just recent ones off the top of my head right we're now. slowly creeping up into the women's yeah. area. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for coming. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. We got some good information out of it.